Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Bradley, and the other day I did a video on personal protective equipment, and I talked about glasses and masks and respirators and suits, um, the different types and things you might look for. And I've been promising to do a video about um, how you might disinfect or decontaminate protective equipment. So that's the purpose of today's video. Okay, so let me start by saying, as I've said at the start of all these videos, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I'm not a medical professional at all. I'm just a, an educated person out doing research, trying to figure out the best way to protect my family, um, and I'm trying to share that, what I learn with others, okay? But don't take my advice as gospel that is absolutely scientifically correct. Uh, there'll be people, I'm sure, who probably disagree or think there are better ways. Um, I encourage you to, to look for other advice as well, especially from you know, professionals trained in the area. With that said, I think there a lot of this is common sense, um, and I think I can offer some general guidance to people uh, in a practical way that, that I think would help people, all right? And you can be the judge of that. All right, so let me start by saying that um, what I've done to try and figure out how to decontaminate protective equipment is I just did a bunch of reading, okay? So if you search the web about um, decontamination, you'll find that uh, decontaminating things that are affected by the coronavirus, any coronavirus really, um, is, is not particularly difficult to do in terms of the, the idea behind it. You know, you can use all kinds of disinfectants um, to essentially eliminate the, the viability of the virus. It's not really a living thing, um, but to deactivate it, if we'll just call it that. And, and the EPA just recently came out with a list of approved cleaners and disinfectants, and the things that you'd expect to be on there are all on there, Lysol and Purell and bleach, and you know, there's a long laundry list that they came out with. You can certainly search the web. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency came out with that just a few days ago. Um, but if you, know, if you have a cleaner that's got bleach or some other disinfectant in it, it's very likely on that list and would be effective in killing uh, or getting rid of this virus on a, on a surface, a hard surface. So I don't think it's a, a question so much of that, that the coronavirus, the COVID-19, is all that difficult to get rid of. Um, it's more about, you know, these are tiny uh, particles, really, that you have to get rid of. And so you have to completely immerse things um, so that you get in every, you know, crack and crevice uh, so you don't leave the virus behind and think that you've disinfected. So that's sort of the eye I'm going to be looking at it um, towards. So... I studied a number of different papers that are out, um, so, some by the CDC, some by the National Institutes of Health. Um, one of them was by the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, if I remember right, which had a really nice um, uh, report that was done a number of years ago, more than 10 years ago, I believe. And in that report, they specifically asked the question, is there a viable way uh, to disinfect N95 respirators? Because that was a concern back then, just as it is today. And we'll talk about that finding when we get to it. So anyway, the, what I just want to start with is just sort of that caveat that what I'm talking about is my opinion. Take with it what you want, um, add to it, take away from it, take different guidance, that's up to you. I'm just going to give you some ideas, all right, about how you might try and uh, decontaminate your protective equipment so it can be reused. It's in such short supply um, that I think that you have to have a viable way of decontaminating it so you can continue to use it, all right? So let me get started. Um, I'll start with the easy stuff first. All right. Okay, so I think the easiest thing to decontaminate are things that are already hard, right? They're made of plastic. Um, so, for example, the glasses. These are some of the glasses I recommend. These are the over glasses, uh, and these are the regular glasses. And to disinfect glasses like this, what you'd want to do is make up uh, a bleach mixture, a bleach solution. Okay, now the CDC has a recommendation of using one third cup bleach to one gallon of water. All right. Now, it's a little bit tricky because bleach comes in different concentrations, and that's the typical five and a quarter to six percent or so bleach. So one third cup to one gallon of water, and that's fine. And it gives you just a little bit over a thousand parts per million, which is known to be effective at killing various types of pathogens. So that's fine. If you use the higher concentration bleach, let's say you use eight percent, you can dial that back to a quarter cup of bleach to one gallon and it'll give you roughly the same uh, concentration of about a thousand parts per million, a little bit over that. And I think that's great. I think that's the general solution you would use to disinfect uh, any kind of hard item that you have, all right? And so the way that it's recommended that you do it um, is you create a solution up. So again, let's say you're using 6% bleach, you put a third of a cup of bleach, put a gallon of water, you then 
put the item into the mixture, you know, maybe you have some tongs or something to push it down into the mixture, and you let it sit, you want it fully submerged and really coated well, and you let it sit for two minutes, okay? After two minutes, you remove the item, you rinse it with fresh water, and then you set it aside to let it dry, okay? So that's the general method of disinfecting any hard item. That would be glasses would be a good example of that. Um, respirators, like this is a half, half face respirator. I've got the cartridges on it. These would come off um, and you'd put the, the uh, mask down into the, the solution and, and you know, get it down in there good. Let it sit two minutes, take it out, rinse it, and let it dry. Now the cartridges themselves you would not want to put into the mixture because you know, they have this fibrous material inside and it would just get all clogged up uh, and ruined. Um, but luckily they have these uh, hard surfaces all around them and they can be cleaned with uh, disinfecting wipes would be the way I would recommend them. And so you can wipe them down with disinfecting wipes um, and, and really get a good scrubbing on it as opposed to dunking it down into the liquid. Uh, and you get it all wiped down really good uh, and then set that aside as well. It, it's not perfect because there, of course, viruses could definitely have gotten down inside of the filter, but really you're counting on the filter to protect you from those viruses anyway. And, and our goal is not to try and you know, clean out the filter. That's not gonna be possible. Our goal is to clean off the outside so that when we handle the filter, we don't recontaminate our hands, okay? So that's the goal of that. Same way with full face respirators. Um, you know, these are meant to be able to go down in a bleach solution. Um, I believe 3M's products, and that's true of the half-face respirators too, I believe they're all safe to 5,000 parts per million bleach, which is about five times the, the level that I'm, uh, the CDC is recommending, which is that third cup per gallon water. So they can take more bleach, you know, stronger bleach solution than what's being recommended, but eventually you start degrading the materials, and so I don't recommend going above that third of a cup per gallon water if you're using standard 5 to 6 percent bleach or a quarter cup if you're using that 8% bleach, okay? So hard, hard surfaces, uh, plastics and rubbers like this, dunk it down in the solution, rinse it off, uh, dunk it down, let it sit for two minutes, pull it out, rinse it off with fresh clean water, set it aside and let it dry. Okay, next let's talk about gloves and suits. So uh, I talked about different types of gloves and the ones I recommend and some of the thinner gloves. Um, the gloves are so inexpensive, you know, you can buy a box of 100 gloves for anywhere maybe between 10 and $25, depending on the quality you get. So they're, they're inexpensive, and, and, the, and there's really no reason to try and disinfect them. I'm not saying they can't be disinfected, I'm just saying there's really no reason. You should just buy a supply of gloves so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, so my recommendation on gloves is, you know, you remove them when you're entering into the safe space, you get rid of them and dispose of them where they don't contaminate your safe space. And that may mean changing gloves several times a day, all right? So you may end up needing quite a few pairs. But again, it's just such a low cost investment in your health. I think the easiest way is to always just dispose of them. Now, the, the Tyvek suits are more expensive. Um, you know, they can run you, uh, by the time you have them shipped to you, you know, it might be $25 or something to get a suit. And you, know, you can get a box of them for cheaper. Maybe they end up being $15 if you buy a box of six of them or something. But they're still pretty expensive. But I don't think um, they're normally going to be worn. I don't, I don't think people, I'm going to go to the grocery store, let me put on my full you know, Tyvek suit and my mask and all. I, I think most people would not go to that extreme. Um, they would really probably only be put on if the situation had turned really, really severe around you, where you literally felt like you know, your life was in jeopardy and you had no choice but to leave the home. Maybe you're attempting to leave a really heavily contaminated area. Uh, in which case you'd put on the suit and all your other protective equipment and you would try and get out of that area. And when you arrived wherever you needed to be, you would remove it and dispose of the suit, okay? There may be ways to disinfect it. I've read a number of ways people have suggested with bleach solutions um, or various types of gases that could be used, uh, perhaps do it, ozone and so forth. Um, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to know the methods that you would be really effective at decontaminating a, a full suit with every little crack and crevice. Uh, I think it would be a truly difficult thing to do. So I'm, my recommendation is you only wear them when you absolutely need them and when you get to where you, you need to take it off, you take it off and dispose of it, all right? So that takes care of the suits and the gloves. Okay, now let's talk about probably the topic that most people are interested in, which is decontaminating disposable respirators, like these N95 respirators, all right? Now, these things used to be really cheap, a dollar a piece or something like that, and now they're much more expensive. You might pay $15 for one respirator. 
Now that might be okay if you could wear it for a month and, uh, and $15 is pretty reasonable, but if you literally have to take and get a fresh one each and every day, well, one, it's expensive, and two, you have to have quite a stockpile if you're gonna make it through, let's say, 90 days. Um, so people are understandably looking for a way to decontaminate uh, the surface of the, the, re the respirator, and I think that's reasonable. Now, there are a number of ways I looked into, and there's some publications out there that various researchers have put out over the last, let's say, 15 years. Now, I do want to emphasize that the only full study I found, which was by the National Academies of Science and Medicine, um, they essentially found no real viable way um, to decontaminate N95 respirators. They didn't have a recommendation at the end of the day. Their recommendations were, you know, to try and cover it with uh, like a doctor's mask to try and keep its, what gets on it to a minimum and then throw away that little doctor's mask, um, you know, and to just generally take good care of the mask. Now there is various guidance out there that you can wear masks more than once. It's not recommended um, because it's going to be contaminated, but if it's not visibly contaminated with blood or other things, there are certainly medical people who do wear them uh, more than one time in environments. I've read various uh, accounts of that. Not recommended, not the standard practice, but in an emergency, people have been known to do that. So, but the bigger, broader question to me was, well, is there a way to, uh, even if it's not an approved method, you know, nobody has proven 100% this is the way, because again, masks are all different sizes and shapes and materials. It, you know, it's difficult to imagine there's a single method, but is there a reasonable way that might uh, be effective at decontaminating the mask, all right? And there were a number of possibilities. The first one was uh, an interesting one, which is to put them in microwave bags. Um, I, I thought that was pretty clever. You put it in a microwave bag, it has a, a layer of water in it, you seal it up, put it in the microwave and blast it, and it's gonna get really, really hot um, and will get rid of the viruses or any other pathogens. Um, I think it's very effective, however, the study that I read about that said that many masks will deteriorate, they'll get waterlogged very quickly and they'll just deteriorate and they won't survive that very well. Um, other masks did well. Again, it depends on what the materials are. So that was a method, but it didn't seem very general. Um, there were people who advocated using like CPAP machines and ozone um, to destroy the pathogens and that may work well, um, but even just recently in the last couple of days, I think the FDA put out a warning about using CPAP machines to decontaminate things um, because it hasn't really been fully proven out. A lot of the machines, I guess, make a lot of claims, but they're not really fully proven and tested. So it may work great, I don't know, um, but I couldn't find any supporting evidence that really said that's the way. Um, so folks have talked about maybe just rotating their mass, and I think that could work. You know, you can, you can have a large stash of masses, and every time you take off your mask, you put it, you know, at the back of the pile and you go to the front of the pile and take the next one. As long as you had a carefully organized thing, in theory, you know, if, if the furthest away mask was two weeks old, by the time you put it back on, the viruses shouldn't be active anymore and you should be able to put it on. It's believed they become inactive within about nine days on hard surfaces. Now, I don't know about on soft surfaces like this, if it's longer or shorter. And beyond that, it's also a bit of an accounting nightmare, right? You, you know, you have to keep up with the dates of each one and the rotation, and you can't handle the old masks because, again, they could be contaminated. And masks and clothing can also shed the virus. If you shake it or you move it, you can, you know, drop the virus in other places. And so uh, it doesn't seem like ideal, but it does seem like a method. Unfortunately, most people don't have a large stash of masks. They're just hard to find now. So I don't think most people could follow that. Um, so then their idea was, another idea was, well, let's just spray it, you know, with some kind of a solution, a bleach mixture or a Lysol or something. And it probably would kill or, or, or deactivate the, some of the virus, right? The, would it deactivate all of it? I can't imagine that it would because you're not getting 100% coverage and you're not soaking it. Um, so I think it could do something. I think it would do something to help. But I don't think you, you know, could really with confidence handle that mask afterward and feel like for sure you're not getting the virus on your hands. Um, so that left me really with just one other option, and that was to use ultraviolet light. Uh, and in particular, the UVC light, which is 254 nanometer light. Um, and there's a, a large body of publications that show that UVC light does in fact kill all kinds of pathogens as long as you get enough intensity of the light on the, the material. So that's the, the way I've gravitated toward, and that's the method I'm going to prescribe
for me, for my family, that's the method we're going to do um, to decontaminate disposable respirators, all right? Uh, and you can also use it to decontaminate other things as well, um, you know, your wallet or other things that you think might have been um, contaminated, all right? And I'm going to talk about uh, what, what particular devices I think um, people should consider using for this application. All right, so to figure out which UVC product um, I wanted to recommend, what I did is I, I got a whole bunch of different products and took a good look at them and then did some research of sort of what's effective and came up with a list of criteria that I want the product to meet. Okay, so let me start by running through that criteria. Again, this is just my criteria. This is what I figured out I want a product to meet. Other people may disagree or have difference of opinions and that's fine. So my criteria really are these seven things. I wanted it to fit two N95s, disposable respirators, side by side, face up, all right? I don't want them to have to go in sideways like a you know, narrow slot that I put them in. I want to make sure the light is shining right down on the face of the respirator where you know, that's this face part here, which is going to be certainly the most contaminated portion of it. So that's one is I want to be able to have two respirators in side by side with the, the bulk of the light hitting them uh, to make it quicker to decontaminate respirators. The second is I, it's important to me that it be safe, all right, that if I put my respirators in there and I close up whatever this box is, that you know, children and other people aren't going to get injured by it. U UV light is dangerous to people. It can harm the eyes and harm the skin. In fact, anytime you're using uh, products that, that don't have automatic cutoffs, you really are supposed to wear glasses. I've got a pair of them here um, that have a yellow tint to them that are supposed to block the UV light from harming your eyes. So it's very important if you work with UV products of any sort that you pay attention to the safety precautions that you need to follow. That's why I really wanted a product that would, that would essentially kind of protect those around me and protect me from doing something stupid. And so when I close it, I want the light to be able to turn on. And when I open it, I want for the light to automatically turn off, okay, so that I can't accidentally be harmed or have somebody else be harmed by it. Number three is if you look at the products, what you'll find is that the vast majority of UV light products um, have a four watt bulb in them, all right? Um, you have to sort of dig through it sometimes, and sometimes the wattage, they're talking about the total wattage of the system, but you want to know the bulb power. And the bulb power is oftentimes just 4 watts, right? Now there are some that have 8 watts, and I wanted one with at least 8 watts of power. Now, you can buy more professional grade ones which have much higher than that even, but to me 8 watts was a reasonable compromise. Now the thing to understand is the higher the, the wattage of these UV bulbs, the more intense the light is, and the less time you'd have to wait um, to deactivate the, the virus, okay? And so there's, there's a product of the two between this wattage and the time, which gives you the amount of energy on some area of surface, all right? And we can talk about that in just a minute, but eight watts minimum is what I wanted to get as a criteria. Next was I wanted the interior of this box, whatever it is, to be very reflective. Some were and some were not. And the idea of the reflective chamber is that that you know, the light is going to come shining onto this, the surface of the mask, but I want the light to be bouncing around at all different angles and hitting the edges of the mask and everything else. And so it's important to me that the box be highly reflective to take advantage of that light reflecting around. I want it to be, I want it to be a good quality product that they've gone to the expense of doing UL, uh, testing to UL standards and EPA standards, all right? And, a lot of the products that we would buy that have UV sterilizers in them are straight from China and they're not necessarily tested to any UL standards. So a company that has gone to the expense to go through that UL type testing and make sure their, their product is EPA approved, um, that tells me they put uh, some, some effort into their product and that it's more of a quality product. And I feel safer using that, all right? I don't want to have one that I plug it in and I go to work and the thing burns down my house, okay? So that's important to me. Number six is I want it to be programmable in the amount of time it can operate, right? So it'd be awfully nice if I didn't just have to turn it on and then remember in, you know, 20 minutes to come back and shut it off because I could easily forget that under a stressful environment and then it could cause perhaps a fire hazard or it could damage the product or it could damage the, the, the chamber itself. And so I want to make sure that it has an automatic timer that will kick itself off, all right? And then finally, you know, if you're willing to spend big money, you can buy really nice UV chambers. Um, they're on the order of $2,500, all right? And they're really nice. They'll do a great job of decontaminating stuff. They have little trays in them that you can set things in them. They're very professionally done. 
and they're meant to last many, many years. Um, but who wants to pay or who's willing to pay, you know, $2,500 for these professional grade um, UV chambers? I don't think many people would. I, um, maybe I'm wrong, maybe people would, but I don't think so. So what was a reasonable number? Well, I, you know, I started thinking, well, what would I be willing to pay? Um, it's, you know, it's not a proven technology, but it is a reasonable precaution. And I came up with a number, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars is, you know, that's not that expensive, and it would give me a method by which I could decontaminate really anything that I wanted that I could put in there, mass or otherwise. Um, I thought that was a reasonable number to shoot for. All right, so these are my criteria. Again, you may have different ones. You may disagree with some of these, and that's fine. So what I'm going to do next is show you some of the products that I looked at. I looked at about 10 different products. I'm going to show you some of those, I don't know, maybe seven or eight of them. And then finally, I'll come back with the one product I do recommend, and we'll talk about how you might be able to get it. All right, so let me show you some of the products that I looked at, and then I'll talk about the one that ultimately I think is the best for this application um, for a number of reasons, all right? So um, I looked at fairly large uh, sterilizers. These are not quite professional grade, um, but they're more along the order of about $500 a unit. Um, I think they do a fantastic job. They've got a timer on them that's a sort of old school timer, rotating timer, which is great. Um, you know, it reminds me of the old days of the microwave. Uh, but a simple enough product to use, which is a good thing, uh, did a great job, but I just think the cost of it um, is probably what would rule it out in my mind. I looked at lower cost options. There are uh, a million different versions of these where they all look very similar, but they have different logos on them. And I, I'm convinced they're all built in the same factory. They looked identical when I took them out side by side. I had three different versions with all different things on them, but they all look identical when you really take a good look at them. They're all built in China. I'm sure that they're built by you know, similar processes. Um, they seem okay to me. Um, but they didn't have the UV power that I wanted. Um, they had a four watt bulb in them. Um, and they didn't meet, uh, most of them didn't have the uh, UL and EPA standard requirements that I was trying to get to. They did meet the cost, they were just under $200, but again, uh, wasn't really my, my preferential choice. All right, and third, I looked at this Pure Light um, unit, which is a little box. And, and these are interesting. Um, you know, it's got a little pop-up uh, lid there, and it, it does have a reflective chamber, although there are portions of it that are not reflective. It has two uh, bulbs, of both four watts, so that meets my eight watt power requirement, which is good. But the mass themselves, the chambers were just too small to get the mass down in there without sort of crumpling it up. Um, so that one to me, it just didn't, it's maybe a very good product, it just didn't seem ideally suited to this application. There were a couple different, um, they're really devices used for purifying like baby bottles and they, they had both heat and UV light, which is an attractive option. Um, and of the two, uh, this one was the EVLA. Um, it had only a single four watt bulb. It had a nice shiny container and it had where you could put two mass in, but it just didn't have enough UV power. Uh, and then this other one um, by Coral um, does have the same sort of options. It, it opens up from the top here. It's got a little release. It's got a nice big chamber and it has two four watt bulbs, which makes it an eight watt bulb. Um, so that one seemed like a more attractive option. Uh, and then I also looked at um, sort of these handheld UV light sources. So here's one uh, and they tend to have more power. They can get, you know, 25, 30 watts of power. Uh, I looked at a couple different ones. This one was lower cost. I think it was 20, 23 watts of power or something like that. So you can get you can get quite a bit more uh, intensity off of these than you would from the others. But it really, it just doesn't meet my requirements for safety. You know, it, you know yes, you can set these things up and, and, you know, you can sort of set them somewhere where they prop and you could set a mask underneath it and you could get just the right distance perhaps and set a mask underneath it. And I thought about that. But the light doesn't reflect around. Um, there's the safety issue of the thing getting knocked over and UV light spilling in everybody's faces. Uh, just didn't seem like um, it met enough of my criteria, although I do think the higher intensity power is attractive. It just doesn't seem quite for this application to be the right thing. Now, this was a more expensive option. This one's by MRSA. It's really nice, um, high power UV wand. Um, that again, if you were just trying to, to, to decontaminate something, uh, might be great if you're just going to have to pass it over the item. But in our case, we're going to want to um, expose the UV mass to quite a bit of 
uh, energy, quite a bit of energy, and that's going to be done by leaving the mask under that UV light for quite a bit of time. And I'll talk about how much time and how, why I came up with that number later. Um, but it, the wands don't really lend themselves to that because somebody has to hold the wand or monitor the wand. And again, there's the safety concerns with it too. So I kind of ruled out the wands. So let me talk about my top pick uh, and then we'll talk about how it might be possible to get one of them. All right, well, it's taken me a while to get here, but I'm finally ready to the point where I can talk to you about the product I recommend uh, to use for decontaminating uh, N95 respirators and really anything, any small items. Um, and it's this, um, it's this UV light chamber by Coral, C-O-R-A-L. Like I said, I looked at a number of products and <clears throat> this one just met all of my criteria, all of the seven criteria that I went through. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive, um, and I think it does a great job, all right? So I'll, um, I'll zoom in on the product and talk about it just a little bit, but that's the product I'm going to recommend. I'm not going to sell it directly. I'm not here to, to sell a UV chamber. Um, there's already lots of them on the markets. So I'm just here to help people pick something that I think would be um, the best for this application. All right, let me show you some of the features of it. So this is the Coral unit. Now, this is really designed to be like a... Uh, sterilizer for baby bottles or pacifiers or small toys, things like that for children. But it really does a great job um, for our application too. All right, so it has a few different uh, operation modes. You can put it on auto, which will let it both have UV light as well as heat, uh, usually used for drying bottles and things like that. Uh, you could certainly use that mode. The only disadvantage is it limits the UV light to 10 minutes. Um, the second mode is sanitize, um, which is just UV light, no heat, and it lets you select the amount of UV uh, exposure you want, and you can set it up to 20 minutes, which I think is really optimal for our application. You want to go ahead and go a full 20 minutes, which um, this unit will disinfect most things within, oh, a couple of minutes or so based on their data that they provide. Um, but nobody has tested this COVID-19 coronavirus in terms of how hardy it is, how easy it is to destroy. So uh, I think it makes sense to go ahead and do a full 20 minutes on it, uh, which this makes it really easy. You put the units in, you put the sanitized 20 minutes, close the door, and uh, you, know, you just come back when it's finished. Uh, it has some other modes too, uh, but it's primarily that sanitize. I think that's the main mode we would use. So to open it, there's a little button on the front. You just push that, it pops open. Um, and it's really nice. It has a, a, a polished interior, a nice deep chamber, um, you could put items down in here, uh, the two bulbs, two 4 watt bulbs in the lid, which is uh, what I was recommending. Now, the only area that it falls short in is it's, of course, it's not meant for N95 respirators. No product is that I've found. Uh, and so if you just take your respirators and you set them down in there, you know, it's, it's just perfectly wide enough for two respirators side by side. You could close the door, get it into sanitize, and you'd be, you'd be good, except for the the distance from the mass to the lights is maybe about six inches when you place it in there like that. And that is really not uh, ideal. The intensity of the light is a very strong function of distance from the bulb. And so we want nice intense light on the product. So that means our mass needs to be, you know, up close here, up close, very much closer to the bulbs. And so there's a number of ways you could do that. Um, you could put something down on the bottom of the chamber like a book or a block or something to support the mass, you know, and then just support the mass like so. The problem with that would be that now you've, you've blocked off the bottom of the chamber and you're not going to get that reflected light up underneath. And that's really important for our application. You know, we want the light to, to reflect back up and, and help uh, sanitize the edges of the mask as well as the straps. And even the bottom, the inside of the mask from you breathing in, it'd be nice to be able to disinfect that as well. So it's not ideal to just set it on top of something. You're not going to expose the bottom of the mask to very much light. So that doesn't work too good. So I took a little time, you know, I really believe in the product. I think it's the best solution. So I thought, well, all right, let's figure out how we would do this. And there's, I'm sure there's a hundred ways to do it, but a way that I came up with, which I think is um, a good solid way, um, is th the product comes with a basket, and that basket's meant to sit in one corner, which is great for putting your keys in here or your cell phone or something like that. But it doesn't work well for the mask because the masks, for one, are too tall, and for another, they would end up getting crumpled to get put in here. So it doesn't really work for our application. But um, what I came up with was there's a way to, to take the basket and use it inside the chamber 
by the insertion of some small metal hooks. And these metal hooks uh, adhere to the walls of the chamber. Now the way I have it done, I have five hooks. I think that's probably the most efficient way to do it. And then you can take the basket and place it inside. The basket will go in upside down. You'll place the basket inside um, to allow you to uh, store these masks, right? All right, so what you do is you take the basket. It's got a couple little, a little eyelets here that you can use um, to place on the hooks. And then it just sort of goes down in there and sits flush. There's a hook on the back side here that's supporting it. And then there's two hooks on the sides as well. So the basket sort of sits in the center of the chamber. Again, it's upside down, so it's flat. And then you can take these respirators and you can rest them on the shelf and on that little side hook. You can do that on either side here. And you end up with a really nice situation where your masks are supported. They're very close to the light, which is what you want. And everything's exposed. There's still lots of reflective surfaces, so the light's bouncing all over the place. And you get a really good exposure of the mass, all right, which, which is what you want. So you put them in there like that. You'd close it. You'd hit sanitize, dial it up to 20. I think there's three different time settings. Go to 20 minutes. It'll just automatically start. Uh, nothing gets hot. The masks don't get real hot or anything like that. And you just let the thing run. And then it'll uh, tell you when it's finished. And you can come and open it up, take your mask out. And then at least you'd have some measure of confidence that, now, that they're decontaminated or, or sterilized. Now, there's no definitive, you know, external test, independent test that shows they're 99.9% .9 sterilized or no, anything like this. Nothing like that. This is a, a qualitative, um, you know, you know that UV light does indeed deactivate viruses and kill various pathogens. We're exposing our mass to a great deal of that light at high intensity. So it's only logical and it makes sense that we've helped to sterilize the mask. Now, I can't guarantee, no one can guarantee that the masks are fully sterilized. That test has never been run. This product is not designed specifically for this application. I'm, I'm recommending it for use in this application, but that's just me recommending it, all right? Um, so, but I do believe in this recommendation enough that this is the way I'm doing it. This is the way I'm disinfecting N95 respirators. And I think it's a, a very viable way um, to do so. so Let's talk just a minute about how you'd go about ordering one of these products. It's really a, a fantastic time to get one. Uh, there's a really good discount possible uh, to order one. So let me talk about that next. All right, so I talked about what I think is the best solution for disinfecting N95 respirators. And it's also a general purpose uh, solution for disinfecting other things like your cell phone or your keys or things that you're handling, um, your kids' toys, anything that can fit in there. I think it's a, it's a very good solution for it not perfect. It's not proven for this application. Again, everybody understand that, please. This is, you know, my educated guess and my recommendation to people. Me sharing uh, my ideas of how I'm going to protect myself. Maybe others want to do the same. Maybe you want to do differently. So the question is, how do you get one? Well, they're out of stock everywhere, like really any quality UV product is right now. So I wrote the president of the company and asked him, you know, what does that look like in terms of the stock and situation? And they're going to be getting in a large batch toward the end of April. They're going to be shipping the first week of May. So while that sounds like a little while away, about seven weeks or so, you know, that time will go by before you know it. And either we'll be in one of two situations. Either the virus will be subsiding due to warm weather, in which case just be thankful. Be thankful that your family and you are not worried about catching it dying. Uh, rest assured that come in the fall, it's going to spike back up, likely much worse than it was this spring and you know that you'll have you'll have use for this disinfectant chamber um, and you'll be glad that you have it in the worst case scenario it's not going to subside and we're going to have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cases around the u.s by may and in that case you'll most definitely be thankful that you have something like this to help disinfect things so i think it's a no-lose situation by getting one all right uh, it's a shame we can't get one you know the snap of our fingers and have it tomorrow but i think it's well worth getting now and it's worth getting uh, on the list to get one in this very next batch. All right, I'm going to put the link on the screen here of where you should go to go ahead and pre-order it. Um, remarkably, they're normally $169, which is under my $200 threshold, but remarkably, um, they're going to sell them for $109, which is a steal, in my opinion. It's a steal. Um, so I really recommend, uh, you know, anybody who has disposable respirators and they're worried about um, running out of them and they want to disinfect them, or they just want to disinfect other things that they're coming into contact with, I, I think it's absolutely a good buy. I would recommend doing that. All right, so that's the Coral uh, uh, UV light system. 
uh, and I put a link on the screen so you can follow that. Now, there is one thing to know is that, as I mentioned just a moment ago, it's not designed or proven, either one, but specifically designed for N95 respirators. And so it doesn't have a tray or anything that really holds the respirators. And if you just set the respirators in the bottom, you're definitely not getting uh, the maximum intensity of UV light that you'd like on the respirators. So as I showed a minute ago, I came up with a way of using these, um, these reflective metal hooks that adhere to the walls of the chamber. And if you put them at just the right places and you use just the right hooks with the 3M adhesive, they work fantastic. I went through a number of different kinds that didn't work so well. Uh, but these work really well. They fit the basket just right. They adhere to the walls of the chamber perfectly. Um, so you need five of them. Uh, and yes, you can hunt around and find some. Maybe some you find will work as well as these. Um, but just as a courtesy to people, I'll sell a packet of these hooks on my website, disasterrepair.com. I'll put the link on the screen there too. So if you're going to get one of the chambers for this purpose, definitely get a set of hooks or maybe two sets just in case you mess up and you want to use a, you know, be able to do a different set in there. Or you have other ideas of how, of how to uh, suspend things in there. But you can order a set or two of hooks. And what I'll do is I'll also have a drawing made, a professional drawing made, showing where the hooks go and how the basket suspends on it. Again, the basket flips over upside down and suspends so that it's flat. Um, that way, you, you know, you don't have to guess yourself and fumble around with placing the hooks and having to pull them off and replace them. Um, so keep, you know, if you're, if you're going to get a product, go ahead and get a set of hooks uh, and the drawing will come with it, tell you how to do it. It'll save you the time and trouble, believe me, it'll be worth it to do that. Um, but anyway, that's my solution. I think it's a reasonably well thought out solution. Uh, it's the method I'm going to use uh, to decontaminate respirators and other small devices. So um, is it perfect? Probably not. Um, but I think it's about as good as you're going to get right now. And I think the pricing of it uh, is really very reasonable. I think it's a a prudent precaution to take where we're at right now in terms of this pandemic. So, all right, so that's all I've got. If you have any questions, feel free to post them uh, and I'll do my best to answer them.